You know what premiered uh, last week was the new season of A&E's WWE Legends uh, special. They're two-hour documentaries uh, that they do about WWE stars and factions, perhaps. And they kicked off the new season with the NWO edition. I saw that. You were in that, for God's sakes. Yeah, for like 13 seconds. When you go off and do these things, and then you get the final product, you you see it on television, um, how often is it what you were pitched um, or what you imagined it to be? Or are you sometimes disappointed with the final product? I would say 99.9%. 7% of the time, I think it's fucking rotten. And there's no way to know, right? You agree to do it. You go. They ask you just your questions. Well, you what don't it know is, is, how they're going to frame these answers. You know, and people that... Um, it's, and it's funny because people who um, are in our business, in our industry, that watched a lot of that happen live, um, and... Like the person, like Eric, you know, is is talking on that, mm-hmm. and he says some different things, and but it's it's so hyper edited. I, I'm hearing like what they're using for my soundbite, and I'm thinking like, wow, that wasn't like even in that context, like. I can't. I like. I. It's almost like I came across like harsh at Hogan, the way they edited me. Talking and, about uh, <laughs> when you were talking about his promos when he first joined the NWO, and the, and there was nothing. But there was <clears throat> like a, a three to four minute part in there where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I was discussing to them like that night that he joined us. Like, I'm in the ring in my mind saying, fucking, that's Hulk Hogan. Like, like Hogan is, we turn, like, Hogan's with us. Like, you know, because I equated as a mark, like, Hogan was, was nothing but main event. Like, that's what Hogan was. He was just a main event guy. If you were in something with Hogan, Especially in that fucking red and yellow. Mm -hmm. So, but if you would have heard me say that during that um, show, I think coming from me, a part of the faction, is more impactful than somebody else or a voiceover person stating how over Hulk is Mm. or was or wasn't. You know, I mean, there, there's a reason he turned heel because, you know, it, it, it had ran its course. The yellow and red had ran its course. They weren't, we, we watched, you know, the, the watch along on Ed Free and uh, we watched that and it uh, wasn't pretty. When you do these, let's take A&E just as an example. There have been other documentaries I'm sure you've part of but when you do these how smart like are the crew the producers the interviewers are they smart to the business are they able to have it or are they just reading like pre-prepared questions sometimes they're fucking really good like sometimes you know like like, uh there's a couple of cats that, that we work with that have done 30 for 30s Okay, right. For ESPN, they have, they've done some like some really nice pieces of, uh, of you know, journalism, and I think that's the thing is, the guys that take it and cover that in a journalistic uh, format instead of a sports entertainment format, I think those are the, are the more successful. At least I think they draw me more. Because it's just, I'm, I want to hear the analytical, you know, I don't want to hear fucking wrestling jargon. 
So if it's too inside, if they're too smart, then it just becomes uh, like just another wrestling piece, like talking to another wrestling guy as opposed to someone who's trying to probe a little deeper. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I I like when – I don't want two guys jerking each other off. Like I, I want somebody like God. It would be so, like every time somebody comes along, it's like I know there's not going to be a new question, but God, it would be so refreshing if somebody asked it in a different fucking form. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's just like yeah. So tell me about oh, fuck, and then it becomes people like like well, you know, there's uh a tape of him discussing the Fargo match uh, where he basically counter, counter, uh, contradicts like uh, nine-tenths of what he says. Yeah, maybe because <coughs> I was getting paid fucking a thousand bucks and I didn't really give a fuck. <coughs> like, when, when it's A&E and they're paying you fucking a decent, a B, you know, like you... And plus, once you fucking don't have pigment in your hair anymore, it's like it's time to maybe be semi-serious. So, I don't know. I just thought that it was bullshit that they, and that was like, that wasn't long after Scott passed that I did my sit down. And it was like he threw a couple of softballs and he like went right into Scott. Mm. And... I, like nobody had asked me anything about Scott on tape, and I just immediately, you know, I just, I break down. So what I, of that whole show, which I think is um, two hours of, of actual like, network spacing, but I don't know what what that was, I think it was eight, about eighty five minutes without okay. commercial. Yeah, I, I I didn't pay attention to it, but uh, <coughs> and the whole and all that time. I probably spoke maybe four minutes on tape. I was probably two minutes of the show, and they put, had to put me fucking breaking down. Well, did you honestly not expect that? I mean, that that's no, moment. that's I mean, that's of course. I mean, but I mean that. God, man, it's just it's so control your fucking your own universe. Your it's like. There's no, there's no history in the WWE or anything that they own the library. It's the history according to. It's not. There's not a, a, a definitive history. Right. Which I thought when I watched this, um, there was some interesting universe building. Let's call it that. For people who were not familiar with wrestling at the time, you got to kind of give the lay of the land at the time what's going on in wrestling. And there were three letters that were absent from the telling of the story of wrestling going from the cartoonish silliness of 91 and 92 to more serious, uh, dangerous, uh, and that's ECW. Now, any programs that WWE are highly involved with, you're not going to see that. But the precursor to the NWO, to the the black and white, to the... They're showing barbed wire in the cutaways in this show. They're showing garbage pails. Those weren't in rings before ECW, maybe in Japan, um, in fairness. But uh, but here, uh, the big federations took their cue on how to change the business and that the business needed to change by watching what this little company in Philadelphia was doing to garner attention from the boys. You know, they were all watching it and talking about it. And then um, up to the office staff. I thought it was an egregious omission not to have the flaming tables, barbed wires, and garbage cans if you're going to show them in this documentary and where all that came from. It wasn't the aha moment from Eric where, hey, bad guys are cool now. They were tipped off to that in wrestling. In, in popular culture first, like the Tarantino movies and, you know, where bad guys kind of acted like good, cool guys. And then in wrestling with ECW. 
I just have to get that off my chest. So that was my one so, criticism. Uh, I, and, and, and to me, like, like when did ECW start? 92. 92, it was in the bars. Then in uh, by 93, uh, Paul Heyman was hired as Booker, and um, they acquired some cable television, first on Sports Channel America, which did have national reach, but it was on like all over the, the dial. Um, then they got a contract with uh, Sunshine Network, which was Florida, and MSG Network, which was New York. So they got some regular reach there. And uh, that's the contract that actually ended up killing them because it was so expensive. But um, yeah, so 92 through 94, Four or five were the formative years, and then yeah, I I didn't I didn't get a chance to see hardly any of that because we were you know that's one thing is fuck we were on the road so much right <clears throat> you know it was just and if I would have came home and put fucking because it was like on Sunshine Network or something yeah. like that where, like two uh, in the morning or something yeah, yeah down here in Florida like if I would have thrown fucking wrestling on on my days off fuck I've got a steak knife in the neck. Hogan said an interesting thing in this documentary when he is asked about joining the NWO and working with you guys. Um, I'm going to paraphrase, but he said uh, he said it was difficult because we didn't like each other. He referenced referencing you and Scott and and him. W- was there a was there heat beyond just the difficulty in trying to get the promos right? Because I know you guys were doing a little coaching i think it was i just think it was he was used to doing business a certain way and we were used to doing business a certain way and i mean you get scott and i together it's just like there's there's like there's a chance one of us might might be mistaken but two of us together if we both decide it's correct no we're Mm. right We're, we're right and there's more of us so but, was it difficult being in a room together? Like, were, were, was there oh, friction no. with Terry? Or <clears throat> no, it's never. I, I mean, it, because at the same times, we it, it, like people have to realize we're both marks for the guy. You know, everybody's a mark for fucking Hulk. So it's like you you can't have like because there's no there's, you don't want to strike him. Like you see, what I mean, like you, you don't have that. It doesn't have that that kind of heat with you where you want to strike. To me, that's a like. I didn't like Piper, and he didn't like me, and you know, I would have, you know, that was just waiting to happen. Right, but that wasn't the case with Hulk. No, I did, but I didn't care for Roddy. I didn't care for Roddy at all. Why? I thought he was a bully. I thought he bullied people. Like, I think he kind of bullied his way around. I think he told a lot of fucking stories about being fucking, you know, really good with his hands and all this other shit. And he came at me one, one, one night in a fucking locker room in Boston. I fucking bitch smacked, just bitch smacked him. And uh, Hulk was in that room, and fucking so was, uh, was Pac that are still alive. Randy was in there. I don't know if Eric was in there or not, but I remember when Piper had his, his uh, podcast, he called me up on, on the phone. He said, can we go over it? And, I, and you say, I, I'll say I, I, th- I threw you out of the room. Like, I, you know, like I ended up, I'm like, no, he didn't fucking, he didn't toss me out of the room. He wanted to do a little revisionist history. Yeah, he was like, you know, because I, I guess he didn't want, I guess somebody had brought it up and it was like, it was his torn quad, you know? Right. So it yeah, was like, it's people, true. people just kept going to it. Much like my CTE and my stuttering. And my but, and my and my heavy uh, grandpa uh, breathing. <clears throat> but what... Uh, Something I always talk to you guys about on camera with the kayfabe uh, shows was I was very aware of the stylistic change 
that had happened in wrestling. So when Hogan was added as a viewer, I was like, oh my God, that's so cool and unexpected. I'm like, but he doesn't fit. Like I knew that something was going to be off unless he was had been trained and was going to totally change up the whole thing. So when I would always ask you or and Scott about it, and you said like the first night when it was like brother, 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 and like I guess what you guys like stepped out and like sat down uh, somewhere and we and said down, we sat down at a picnic table, and Eric, you know, was was in there with Jimmy and Hulk, and Eric came out, came to the picnic table, and Eric basically was just like, like you know, he's like this ain't working, is it? We're like, no, like it's, it's just not working. So when you have to go back in and, <laughs> and save the segment. So, I mean, so Scott came up with just trying to do some different things where he grabbed the, the, the camera and was like filming, like, you know, he was filming with the camera on camera. And then Neil said he could, he could t- go ahead and, and like actually shoot something and frame it so in case we got anything good, he could splice it in with what we were doing. And then I think I think Neil Pruitt was the one that came up with it. Let's do it in black and white, and do it you know with that effect that it looks like a, a, a cut of a, of a film. Mm-hmm. So you could trim yeah. stuff that. So, wasn't gonna make it. Yeah, but it, it, once you got kind of a um, a specific thing that everybody was was talking about in the promo, it would just be those, you know, those little blurps about, you know, say maybe just it was the Horseman, and it would just be you know, bang bang, and everybody would just would you know. One guy would just woo, and if I could cut to somebody else saying something, so it was just it. Def, I mean, you think about that, and then you think about like when we came out that it was black and white. You know, like they changed the, the television screen to black and white. Right. So, I I've always uh, I've always admired Hogan. And there was a little stretch there for a while where Hogan was always talked about kind of like a, I guess because of the the red and yellow years and the repetitive work in the ring and and the promos that had become cartoonish after a while. But I was always very aware of how good of a businessman he was, number one. But number two, how he knew... He knew when he had to change. They talk in the documentary that he had resistance to turning heel because of the legacy. But then he realized he needed to do it. Second turning point. He is humble enough to go when he's put with you and Scott. This isn't my show anymore. Uh, best I can do here is be part of a group, part of the band an equal part of the band. And it didn't have to be about him alone anymore. He was able to kind of settle back beside you two. And he he realized by us, like we'd throw to him and shit, like we were were still featuring Hollywood Hogan. I mean, we were the NWO, but we were featuring Hollywood Hogan. Like we didn't have a problem with that. That was cool. As long as we were all doing cool shit. Like, I used to love to get fucking baked and put on my fucking NWO t-shirt and my fucking black sunglasses, some fucking Ray-Ban cool cats, sit in the back with my Tommy Hilfiger black fucking mom jeans on with a fucking NWO tucked shirt tucked in with a fucking belt and a fanny pack and a, and a fucking phone beeper. Life was fucking sweet. And we'd go out there and Hogan would talk for fucking the first four minutes. And fucking, they'd say, we're out. You fucking walk back and be, well, one down. Here we go, another Monday. And 
Fucking How was he with? <coughs> and Hogan always had fucking beer in his in his fucking uh, locker room. I'm talking like cases of beer. There was always like it got to the point. I think anybody that was around him, like you, just became like I couldn't re- even think about going like having a match. I couldn't even think about having a match unless I had two beers. Because <coughs> you get so tired of drinking coffee and water in the building all day. Doesn't slow you down, make you sluggish? All that brew? Oh, fuck no, just two beers. I mean, two beers. To stand out there, lean on the rope, and listen to Scott talk? D- d- doesn't blow you up? Not, not a fucking... Not, or, or actually be in a tag match and, like, put my elbow on the fucking turnbuckle and watch Scott work. Never fucking got tired of that. Good for just, you. I mean, yeah, just, I, and do it well. Right. And uh, like, I'm a, I can be, fuck, I can be probably the most cavalier wrestler. I mean, at times I have a, a certain cavalierness to me where it's just, you would almost think in my mind, I'm like, I don't give a fuck. It feels that way. It's nothing like that. It's like I'm, I'm in it. I'm, I'm like you know. We talked about this on the on the free for all. With the, the ad free, it's. You look at the Yeti and you see the commitment that that young man makes that evening in Cobo Hall in Detroit, Michigan, and you say to yourself, "How can I bring anything less?" That, and then you do. And exactly. It's yeah. like, wow, I'm fucking special. It's called lowering the bar. Yeah. And, and somebody has to. And you had a skill for that. You know, it's just, it's almost like people say, wow, man. Like, I, oh, it was like I, we, on the ad free show, like somebody said, I counted nine moves in your first match that you did. So my, my skill set was, I mean, too high. Yeah, you had to cut that in half. Right. You had to, you had to chop that down. Absolutely. Yeah. You got rid of the chop. Yeah. Um, I think you had a, like a belly bump in the corner. That that was gone shortly thereafter. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Eric Bischoff's role in this. I'm a big Bischoff, Mark. I always have been. Um, but something I forgot that I was reminded of when I watched the A&E show was... I, I knew he was in the ring on promos, of course, all the time. I forgot he started to work a little. Uh, getting involved in matches. And th- that, and he, of course, the, it positions him as being very critical of that decision. And I think that with the hindsight now, <coughs> probably shouldn't have. Um, but that was at the very end of that run, right? I never had a problem with him getting Really? Are you doing karate, <clears throat> you doing like some karate kicks or some shit? Yeah. You don't think that was overstepping? You don't think that was part of the the overabundance of of what was going on and it, it, it too felt, much? It, no, to me it felt completely like it, it was very normal. He was just one of the boys. I mean, it just well, to, to you guys, but to the, to the viewer though, it's very different. Right? Ah, we, fuck them! What are they going to do? <laughs> shut, fucking shut us down and sell the company? No, <laughs> <clears throat> that's called the final ten minutes of the show. <laughs> so, if we're going to go to the final ten minutes, how could this have been reversed? I was thinking as I'm watching it, like, what decisions could have been different? None to take this into in, to a different. Uh, angle so that even after the it, sale, it, maybe it was it wasn't it wasn't about anything that we were or weren't doing. It was the fact that they fucking didn't want to have wrestling. Period. In the period. portfolio of AOL Time Warner yes. products, yeah, because um, Future Media, I think that was it was the, the company uh, was going to buy WCW. Fushint Media right. was going to buy a WCW, and Eric had the vision that the WWE would, you know, own the Northeast, 
but we would have our logo on top of the sphere. And we would run like a fucking, like a, a, a weekly show from Vegas. And we, that was what the, you know, that was the, the idea. And, but we had to have, of course, someplace to put that. And Eric, you know, just was hoping that we could, you know, put that, uh, that two hour show back on TV. T, on t, I think he wanted to be on TNT, mm -hmm. you know, stay with the, with the, with the higher, but they, I, I never understood like when we when we were actually making money hand over fist, like, and we were doing like six ratings and crazy shit, mm. and they would spend fifty million dollars on some period piece that was, you know, kind of artsy but not really watchable, you know, what the watches of the fucking Titanic. Oh, great. Um, but, and it would open, um, they did a Holocaust one, one time and it opened to like a fuck, maybe like a point three. Like that was like what it opened on the premiere. It did like a point three and we're doing like fives and we're doing fives every fucking week. And this thing, like. It didn't draw a fly, and it cost like forty-five million dollars to fucking make. And you're gonna play it how many times? And our our budget's forty-five million dollars, or fifty, or sixty, or whatever the fuck it is. But we're, we're giving you seven to nine hours of live TV every week. Three hundred and are you kidding me? Mm. So it's safe to say, in your estimation, that. Um, the demise of the company was unrelated to any decisions that were made yeah. in programming. It was, it was if all. If you corporate. go back, if you go back and look at the look at the eight um, weeks in ratings that follow the finger poke of doom, we beat them eight straight weeks. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty fucking sure that we beat them. The following seven or eight weeks after the after the finger poke of doom, but everybody wants to to go to that as the demise because there isn't any one thing; it's just the fact that they didn't want to have professional wrestling mm -hmm. in their portfolio. Period. That finger poke has taken on a life of its own, really, as far as. And my whole thing is is. Anytime you can do something of that significance, I mean, everybody knows the guy in the white cowboy hat is holding Lee Harvey Oswald when Ruby comes up. But who really knows that man's name? Hmm. Everybody knows Jack Ruby. Buck Zumhoff. Buck says Buck Zumhoff's father. What do you hear? Remember they Uncle was, Uncle Buck. Remember that um one of those deals where the uh they had a picture of some hobos, but they were dressed really and they said that one of them was a, a paid assassin that was Woody Harrelson's father. Do you remember that one of those Kennedy fucking deals? No uh no. Yeah, it was like Woody Harrelson's father was one of the shooters. The grassy knoll. Or maybe I dreamt it. Fuck. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. I'm going to ask yeah. Woody about it, maybe. But. Yeah. So, in, in conclusion, the. Um, we kind of bounced around a little bit with the show tonight. I think I might have ingested cannabis tonight. This is, this is what we do. 